go to Exodus 12. It won't be very long this morning. Famous last words. All right. Exodus chapter 12. So if you're not familiar with where Exodus is, it's the second book in the Bible. Go to Genesis, then Exodus. At the end of the message, we'll look at one other passage of Scripture, which will be in Romans chapter 10. I'll start in Exodus 12 and verse 3. This is God talking to Moses. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto him take it according to the number of the souls, every man according to his eating, shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish. A male of the first year ye shall take it from the sheep or from the goats, and ye shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening, and they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two sides, on the two side posts, and on the upper doorposts of the houses, wherein they shall eat. And they shall eat the flesh in the, that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs shall they eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire his head, his legs, and with the pertinence thereof. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning shall be burned with fire. And then in verse 12 it says, For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt." Now, baptism is the first step of obedience in a Christian's life. The Bible states the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. According to Scripture, baptism is not a means of salvation, as Brother Ray spoke on just a few minutes ago. And this is because the Bible says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And baptism would be something of yourself, and salvation is not of ourselves. Nor is it a means to have our sins washed away. As the Bible says, The blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanseth us from all sin. Baptism is a picture of what Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary and that the person being baptized has already trusted in the finished work of Jesus Christ to save them from their sins and from hell. And they'd want to make that, that profession public. Now the Bible explains this, explains it like this. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins. The just that's Jesus Christ, for the unjust, that's you and I, being put to death in the flesh, that's on the cross, but quickened or made alive by the Spirit. So Jesus Christ, as you know the story, he died, he was buried, and three days later he rose again. Now I would like to take a few minutes to explain the importance of what Jesus Christ did on the cross and how that is important for both you and I I'd like to explain to you how through what Jesus Christ did on the cross is the means of our salvation. And to do this, I'm going to use this story here. As you know, this is the first Passover. And I, there are three lambs that are found here in this text. And so I'm going to give you a story of three lambs that are found in the text. And I hope it be a blessing to you. Notice in verse 3, it talks about a lamb. And then in verse 4, it talks about the lamb. And then in verse 5, it calls him your lamb. And so those are the three lambs that we are going to look at in this text. Will you please pray with me? My Father, I thank you for the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is called our Passover in the book of 1 Corinthians. 
Now, Father, as we speak about this Passover here now and then liken it to the Passover where Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, may the gospel message be very plain. The gospel is good news. And Father, we have good news today. But Father, there's some bad news as well that must be delivered. So I pray, Father, that it would be received well. And Lord, if somebody in here, like our brother Ray gave his testimony, somebody is searching for the truth, may they find out that uh, salvation is not in a religion, uh, it's not in money, it's not in baptism, it's found in a person, and that is in the Lord Jesus Christ. So, Father, I pray that the message be very clear today. Please help thy servant as I preach in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, now notice in verse 3 of the text, the Bible talks about a lamb. The text says, they shall take every man a lamb. Now, the first lamb that we will talk about this morning was found about 4,500 years ago down in Egypt. When the Jewish people were in the early days of forming themselves as a nation, they were slaves in Egypt. One day God came to a man by the name of Moses and told him that he was the one that God chose to lead his people out of slavery in Egypt. Now, the execution of this plan didn't go as well as they might have wanted it to go. It didn't go very smoothly. The king of Egypt, the Pharaoh, did not want to let God's people go. So what God did is God brought some plagues on the Egyptians to try to get them to change their mind. Some of these plagues were turning the water into blood. That wouldn't be so nice. Uh, lice was on everything. Flies were everywhere. Frogs were all over the place. And the list goes on and on. There was in total 10 plagues that God brought upon the land of Egypt. Now the last plague involved the Lord passing over every house and looking for something. And if he did not find it, then because Israel was God's firstborn, he would kill the firstborn in that house. This became known as the Passover night. This is the first Passover that ever took place. Now to prepare for this night, this Passover night, a warning was sent out. And in that warning, they were told that they were supposed to take a lamb. They were to kill that lamb, and they were supposed to put the blood on the two side posts and on the upper door posts. And when the angel of death passed over the house, if he saw the blood, then he would not touch anyone on the inside. They were safe. Now this is, as I said, known today as the first Passover. Now notice, first of all, that this was not a collective responsibility. This was a personal responsibility. In the text, it says, they shall take every man a lamb. You see that in verse 3? They shall take every man a lamb. They were to take this lamb and take the, kill that lamb, take the blood, take some hyssop, which was like a, uh, a weed, and they were to take that thing and dip it in that blood, and they were to strike it on the side post and up there at the top of the door. Now, they couldn't depend on what their neighbor did. Every man had the responsibility to do this themselves. Could you imagine a man who got busy with the affairs of life and was counting on the fact that he had a good circle of friends? No matter how good of friends he had, it wouldn't matter if he didn't put the blood on the door. It didn't matter his relationships. What mattered is was the blood applied. Now, this was not conditioned on the character of the man taking the lamb. <laughs> Notice again, it says in the text, they shall take every man a lamb. doesn't say what kind of man the guy was. doesn't say if he was an upstanding citizen or he was a really bad guy. It just says they shall take every man a lamb. Yeah. When the angel of death passed over, he didn't ask what kind of people were in the house. He was just looking for the blood. When God looks at you and I, he lumps us all into the same category, regardless of our age, regardless of our education, regardless of our accomplishments, our religious training, our bank accounts, or even our work history. When God looks at us, he lumps us all into one category and calls us sinners. Because the Bible says, for that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Again, the Bible says, there is none that doeth good, no, not one. And again, it says, all we like sheep 
have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Notice that this was not conditioned on how devoutly religious they were. It says they were to take every man a lamb. If a man thought to himself, well, I'm a very deeply religious man. Surely the angel of death will pass me by. Doesn't he know how well I've been a Jew? Doesn't he know how much I've been down to the synagogue? Doesn't he know how deeply religious I am? It didn't matter how religious the man was. If the blood was not applied, what the man's religious background was did not matter. The angel was looking for blood. His religion did him no good. He wasn't looking for religion. He was looking for blood. When speaking of these same Jewish folks 2,000 years later, and by proxy hitting the rest of us, the apostle Paul writes, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God, for Christ is is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Amen. Notice, my friend, that this text here, this command, it was conditioned upon urgency. If you will notice in verse 12, he says, For I will pass to the land of Egypt this night. I will pass to the land of Egypt this night. It was a very urgent request. They couldn't put it off till tomorrow because tomorrow would be too late. They needed to take care of it that day. My friend, salvation is the same thing. None of us are, are promised another day. You and I have no idea if we will live till tomorrow. Thank God that we've lived as long as we've had. Many of you have accomplished great things in your life, things that I could only dream of accomplishing. But salvation is an urgent matter. And the Bible says, behold, now is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. It's a very urgent thing. One day, death will come knocking at your door and mine, and you and I will slip off into eternity, and you will spend eternity in one of two places, either in heaven or in hell. Hell is described in the Bible like this, as a lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. If it wasn't enough to die once, the Bible talks about a second death that's awaiting the sinner. But the gift of God, is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So in our text here, notice we have a lamb. That's the very first lamb found in the text. And it's the responsibility of every man. But then notice how the interesting choice of words that your King James Bible has. It now goes from verse 3 to a lamb, and into verse 4 it calls it the lamb. The lamb. Very interesting word, choice of words. From the time the children of Israel left Egypt to the time that Jesus Christ showed up, the devout Jews would have to sacrifice a lamb at the commandment of God. This was a law that was given to them. Anytime they broke one of the commandments of God, they would have to bring a lamb as a sacrifice. Once every year, the Day of Atonement, the priests would sacrifice a lamb to atone for the sins of the people. Why did they do this? This is because the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Remission simply means forgiveness. So without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of my sins or your sins. So blood had to be sacrificed. But you see, an animal does not equal to a man. So a ma a animal's blood was not sufficient to take away the sins of the people. What you would need is you would need a man's blood to do that. You say, well, where am I going to get man's blood like that? Am I going to get it from the preacher? Not me. My blood would do you no good. You want to know why? Because my blood is just like your blood. It's tainted by sin. You say, well, what if I went to the best person I know? And I'm sure you could find a whole lot better people than me. And if you don't, if you doubt it, just ask me. I'll tell you how bad I am. <laughs> I'd prefer not to. <laughs> The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You cannot find one person on the face of this earth whose blood would be sufficient to wash away your sins. So that means that somebody out of this world had to come here to give his blood for you and I. You see, the problem is stated. 
that the blood of bulls and of goats could not take away sin, so matter how, no matter how many lambs they sacrificed, it would only be a temporary fix. And that's what they would do on each year at the Day of Atonement. They would have to go back and sacrifice a lamb for the same sins that they'd already sacrificed before. But then one day, a man by the name of John the Baptist was baptizing people in a river Jordan. No, he wasn't a Baptist like I call myself a Baptist. <laughs> All of a sudden, as he was baptizing people, he pointed to some man in the crowd and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Now, the man that he was pointing to was Jesus Christ. I say the man because the Bible says there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. You know who Jesus was? He was God manifest in the flesh. We call him the God man. You see, God himself became a man because God's blood was pure. It was not tainted with sin like ours was. You see, my friend, we were born wrong. We were born with sinful blood. We were born sinners. That's why Jesus Christ said, you must be born again. Now, the Lamb, behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. The Lamb is very fitting name for the Lord Jesus Christ. A Lamb is innocent, and so was Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, his biography, as it was told by one of his closest disciples, a man by the name of Peter, was this. He went about doing good. But by the way they treated the Lamb of God, you would not think that he was an innocent man. They treated him like he was a guilty man. My Bible tells me that he was numbered with transgressors. One night while Jesus was praying in a garden called Gethsemane, a group of soldiers led by a disciple turned traitor came to arrest Jesus Christ. They brought him before a religious council. During this kangaroo court, they brought up many false charges against him. The witnesses could not get their testimony to agree. Finally, the high priest, in a rage, brought up a false charge of blasphemy and said that Jesus Christ was guilty of death. So they took him to the ruling Roman governor at the time, a man by the name of Pilate. The Bible describes Jesus during this horrific night in history this way. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter and like a lamb dumb before his shearers, so opened he not his mouth. When Jesus is first brought to Pilate, the first question that Pilate asks is, what hath he done? The response was that if he were not a male factor, that is a criminal, we would not have brought him to you. In other words, Pilate, just take our word for it. We said he was guilty. Find him guilty. <laughs> it's not, uh, that's not uh, the right way to do things. Jesus Christ was not a bad guy. He was a pure and perfect and innocent man. Pilate examines Jesus Christ himself. And finally he says, I find no fault in him at all. He tried to strike a bargain with the mob. You know, that's not going to go over well. <laughs> by offering them a choice. And the choice was between a murderer by the name of Barabbas and Jesus Christ who had healed the sick, raised the dead, just done nothing but good. You know who they chose? They chose a murderer. They chose a murderer over Jesus Christ. Many times when I'm witnessing to people and I ask them, are you a sinner? They will respond by saying, well, I never killed anybody. You see, in our society, if we were to rank somebody as what society considers the worst of the worst, they always go to a murderer. That's what they always say. But when they had a choice between a murderer and God's lamb, they chose a murderer. Who will you choose today? They chose the murderer. Next, he tries satisfying the bloodthirsty crowd by having Jesus beaten. They, Roman, the Roman soldiers took a cat of nine tails 
and these soldiers who were expert in the art of making people suffer began to whip Jesus Christ. Isaiah writes this, that's in our Bible. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Jesus Christ was being punished for every one of my sins and every one of your sins. Every time that whip struck his back and that red warm blood began to spill on the ground, he was taking my punishment that I deserved. He was taking your punishment that you deserved. He was the Lamb of God. After this bloodbath, they made a crown of thorns. They placed it on the head of Jesus Christ, put upon him his own robe, and then presented him to the crowd with the words, Behold the man! You would think that the crowd would be satisfied and that this was enough, but they could not be satisfied with this. No, the bloodlust in their eyes cried for more, and they screamed out in utter defiance, Crucify him! Pilate, seeing he had been bested by the crowd and couldn't do anything, finally capitulated to their will and commanded that Jesus Christ should be crucified. Up Calvary's hill walked our Savior. Up Calvary's hill walked the Lamb of God. Up Calvary's hill, leaving a blood trail of pure blood, walked my Savior, taking my place that I deserve to be there, but he went there for me, and he went there for you. This man had at, had at his disposals 12 legions of angels. I read somewhere that that's roughly around 50,000 plus angels. One thing is very clear. If Jesus didn't let them take him, no one could have killed him. He said this, I lay down my life that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. And I have power to take it again. If you remember in our text in Exodus chapter 12, if you remember in round verse um, 7, where it says that they would strike the two side posts and the upper door post, just like Jesus Christ was crucified between two thieves, just like that blood was on those two door posts and one up here on the top on the upper post, Jesus Christ was crucified between two thieves. But I want to tell you, he was not a sinner. Though he was numbered with transgressors, he was not a sinner. The Bible says, For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. Finally, after several agonizing hours on the cross, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, and said these three wonderful words, It is finished. And then he yielded up the ghost. Why? Why would Jesus allow himself to go through this bloody mess on the cross? Why would he allow these men, the men he created, to take him and beat him and torture him like this? Because the Bible says he did this, out of love. John 3.16, most of you probably know it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You see, he was the only one that God would accept. Jesus, it says about him in the Bible, he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He was our propitiation. He made peace with God on our behalf. Not for ours only, but also for the sin of the whole world. If Jesus Christ had not shed his blood, there would be no final sacrifice for sin. Jesus Christ was God's lamb. That day on the Jewish feast of Passover, Christ, our Passover, died for our sins according to the scriptures. Now, if this is the end of the story, it would be meaningless. What good would it be for a man to go through such a heroic death for the sake of sinners, promising them eternal life, and then he himself not be able to raise himself from the dead? But that's not the end of the story. 
This is why we call this the gospel. The gospel means good news. Christ Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. I want to tell you, the Lamb of God lives today. Amen. Jesus said, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Let me wind down the message this morning. Notice back in our text in verse 5. Notice he calls this lamb your lamb. We had a lamb, we had the lamb, we had your lamb. Notice once again the incredible wording by the Holy Spirit in your King James Bible. He calls it your lamb. You see, it did them no good to have all this knowledge. It did them no good to see their need and do nothing with it. They needed to make this lamb their lamb. They needed to make it personal. You see, it does you no good to understand your sinner and understand that Jesus Christ died for your sins if you are not going to make Jesus Christ your personal Savior. You see, to add something to what Jesus Christ did on the cross would cheapen it. This is why, as has already been said, baptism is not a part of our salvation. So then how does one receive Jesus Christ as their personal Savior? Do you need to join this church? No. How does one receive Jesus Christ as their personal Savior? Do I need to give you communion? No. How does one receive Jesus Christ their Savior? Maybe you need to give a lot of money. No, not at all. A man once asked a similar question of two jailed apostles whose crime was preaching the Word of God. He asked them this. He said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they simply responded, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Amen. Notice they did not say believe in. They said believe on. Yeah. To believe on the Lord Jesus Christ is to trust only in the finished work of Jesus Christ for your means of salvation, plus or minus nothing. If this is you, and you know that you are a sinner, won't you, the best way you know how, receive Jesus Christ as your Savior today? I'm at the end of my message, and I'd like to read one more passage of Scripture. It's in the book of Romans, chapter 10. Romans, chapter 10. When I was a young man, the gospel was presented to me. I knew I was a sinner. I knew if I died in my sins, I would go to hell. I knew that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. He was buried and rose again from the dead. So the best way I knew how, I called out to God as a repentant sinner, and I said, God, will you please save my soul and take me to heaven when I die. Notice in Romans chapter 10, and notice verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. You say, what does that mean? That means saved from going to hell. That means you have an eternal life. That means the second death can't get to you. That means your sins are washed away. Do you see how simple it is? Jesus Christ did all the work. Amen. Verse 10, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You see, notice the heart and mouth are connected because you can make your mouth say anything, but this is coming from the heart. He says, For the Scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Folks, you might be ashamed of a lot of the things that you have done in this life, just like I am. But believing on Jesus Christ is not one of the things you have to be ashamed of. Verse 12, For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon Him. There's no difference. You look around you, we got all sorts of people in here today from all different walks of life, different backgrounds, but there's no difference. The, the, why is that? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. When it comes to salvation, all you need to know is that you're a sinner, and Jesus Christ came to save sinners. Last of all, it says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever's anybody, that's you. Put your name in there. Make it personal. Make them your lamb. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. In conclusion, I'll say this. If you've heard this message this morning and you have never prayed to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, would you like to do it now? If you would not be embarrassed to take this step of faith and call on the Lord, won't you let us help you do that today? 
Now at this time, as I told you, we're in conclusion, and we're going to have a time of invitation. The invitation is simply this, is to act upon what you've heard if it's your desire to do so. This is a very personal thing. It cannot be coerced. It cannot be forced. This is between you and God. We are simply here to help you if that's what you'd like. So in just a moment, I'm going to have Drew come down. He's going to play something on the piano. In just a moment, many of our, uh, once the piano starts playing, some of our, you'll see some of our folks slip out. And they'll come down. They'll begin to pray here at the altar. Many times they like to do that when the Lord's touched the heart about something. Some of our folks will be standing off to the side. Now, the folks you see standing off to the side, if you've heard this message here this morning, and you say, Preacher, I need that. I need Jesus Christ as my Savior. I'm going to go ahead. I want you to come forward. And while the rest of these are praying, and we're all doing our own business with the Lord, you come down and just get one of these people that are here, and they'll take a Bible and show you how to be saved. They'll pray with you. Let's all stand. Father, bless now this time of invitation. Please move in hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.